Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now, podcasting from the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center in Chicagoland, here are your hosts, Ed Stetzer and Daniel Yang. Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the Church Multiplication Institute, and we're excited to have with us today Dr. Leonard Sweet. Dr. Leonard Sweet. Len is a preacher, teacher, theologian, and scholar. He's also the author of more than 70 books and 1,500 published sermons, and his recent publications include groundbreaking textbooks on preaching, evangelism, ecclesiology, and discipleship. Today, we're going to talk about his book, Rings of Fire, Walking in Faith Through a Volcanic Future. But before we hear from Len, let's go to Ed Stetzer, editor-in-chief of Outreach Magazine and executive director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. 70 books. Did you write 70, 70 books? books? No, you know, I If we not. put our books together, that's we like still have not, not equaled 70. 70, not even a third or a quarter of a tenth. Uh, anyway, Leonard Sweet, it is um, so, so, so for those of you who don't know, Leonard, Len and I have known each other for years, so he wrote the forward and wrote this super nice endorsement on the back that they actually, I think they put on the cover. It was something about, it was the category app and category killer or something about planning new churches in a postmodern age, which was later retitled to planning missional churches, um, my original desired title. So Lens uh, blessed me and, 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 and really just spoken in a lot of uh, leaders' lives. So we're super excited to have him uh, here today. And we're going to talk some about, it's, it's sort of complex. I'm going to explain the book. So the book is Rings of Fire, Walking in Faith Through a Volcanic Future, published in 2019, which, wow, you might have, you might know that what followed 2019 was 2020, so there you go. Um, but And it's related to Soul Tsunami. Well, let me have let me have Len explain. Len, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Tell us about the Great book and how it connects to Soul Tsunami. Yeah, 1999, Soul Tsunami came out, and um, it was um, a book that kind of helped the church navigate the waters that it was going into and and um it sold quite a bit of copies so the 20th anniversary they said let's do an update of it what where what did you get wrong what did you get right let's look at the uh let's take a real uh new look at it the first book i did like this i don't know if you remember it was called faith quakes yeah oh for sure and then i went from faith quakes to tsunamis and then um i i did um something called Aqua Church, where I talked about the fluid culture that we're in that followed with Soul Tsunami. But now we're into a volcano. So now the only thing left is an <laughs> asteroid. So if I do another one, it'll have to be uh, a book on asteroid. Asteroid but, Church. Yeah. But at any rate, so this is a, a looking at that. I initially submitted 50 uh, rings of fire. They cut it down to 25, knocked off 500 pages. So it's a lot shorter than it, it originally was intended. But um, but these are um, these are some rings of fire that are these volcanoes that are erupting in the culture that the church has got to uh, contend with. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, we definitely sense and feel that reality uh, all around us. Of course, you wrote this came out in 2019, um, and then we stepped into 2020, and it seems like uh, the volcanoes are everywhere. And he loves the word pictures. I tried the word pictures on a book once called Viral Churches, and in mm -hmm. hindsight, that didn't work as well as, but anyway, uh, Rings of Fire, uh, Walking in Faith Through a Volcanic Future. So talk to me about this symbolism. You love symbolism. I, I tell people, last time we spoke at an event together, I said, Leonard Sweet has a constant, like, three Hollywood movies running through his brain at the same time while he's teaching whatever he's doing. So you love symbolism. Why volcanoes as the central image of the book? Uh, well, First of all, volcanoes are, I, I live in the shadow of volcano Mount Rainier. So that was uh, very foremost in my mind. It's an active volcano. And one day it will, uh, it will blow. And these are all very stages of blowing in these volcanoes. Some of them have gone off yet. Some of them are. But the, the good thing is that the lava that is produced by a volcano is some of the richest soil uh, out there. And um, the, that coffee, Kona coffee, is is one of the world's best coffee, but it grows in lava-rich soil. So if, if you can handle the volcano, deal with the volcano, prepare for the volcano, what's going to follow in the aftermath of that volcano can be some of the richest ground for church planting and, and doing new ministry. So it's, it's not a pessimistic book. It's actually an optimistic book, although I do. This is 2019, and I warned in the book that China, this is 2019, and I said in Rings of Fire that China 
was going to catch a virus. When it sneezed, the rest of the world would come down with it. And we better prepare for that. Nobody, nobody listened to me. So part of the, part of the challenge here is preparing. I, I don't believe in planning, but you can prepare. And, um, and so I'm a big preparedness person. Like the, the story of the 10 bridesmaids, you had five strategic planners. They knew when the bridegroom was coming back, they're going to trim their wigs accordingly. You had five that said, no, we don't know. We just got to be prepared. Uh, we got to be ready when he comes. And the ones that went to the party um, were the ones that were the, the scouts, if you will, the, the be prepared people, not the strategic planners. Mm. You mentioned the pandemic, uh, and Len, I mean, you wrote the book, you know, 2019, right before uh, the pandemic happened. And among the topics that you address in the book are race and polarization in the U.S. And you even say that, you know, quote, some of the biggest Vesuvius moments of the future will center on gender. So what, what predictions have you seen fulfilled in, you know, the three years since you published the book? Yeah, well, the, the whole trans issue, uh, both transhuman and transgender, it's a, it's a double a kind of double edged sword there. The the transhuman, which is the increasing uh, kind of cyborgization of the human body, and um, with all these augmentations and and the, these mechanical uh, uh, additions that we're talking about, and then the the issue of uh, transgender. I really believe that the way through all of these thorny thickets is not around the scriptures, but through the scriptures. And so, part of the the challenge is how do we uh, locate ourselves biblically in in the in the midst of all these uh, volcanoes, and how do we uh, have a biblical witness that can help us through it? From your perspective, the way that you're seeing church leaders handle uh, racial topics, uh, topics of gender, how do you think we're doing? Like, if you were to give a scorecard, <laughs> how, how are we doing right now? Um, well, I'm not even sure we're doing. I mean, <laughs> mm. we're we're like. You know, we don't want to deal with the future. And I can understand that because, I mean, the future, when we deal with the future, we're talking about the end of life, our life, our way of life. Uh, the future is what's going to end us. We're all going to die. That's in the future. So we block it. And so, the, but the other thing we're doing is we're also blocking uh, the future that our churches are going to be facing. And and so rather than uh, actually face and outface these issues of of race, and these issues of gender um, and in income inequality and all that stuff. We, we're just hiding from it rather than blocking it, rather than facing it and outfacing it. Okay, so so how then do we uh, do so? You mentioned uh, doing it by going not around the scriptures, but through the scriptures. So how do we do that in such a way that engages the biblical teaching on and around some of these issues? Well, the first thing I think we have to establish, and, and I think this would would lessen a little bit of the stress and nervousness, is to realize that our identity is found in Christ. And that if our identity, that's, that's our primal identity. Our identity is not found in our gender. Our identity is not found in our race. Our identity is not found in our nationalism or nationality. Our identity is not found in our education. Our identity is found in Christ. And so it's the lens of Christ that we look at everything through. And a part of this culture is finding, trying to find an identity and, and create an identity from scratch around all these, other, all these other issues rather than realize that, no, the only identity on which I can build a life is the identity of, in Christ. It is found in Christ and in his story. And as I make him the author of my story, whoever's the author of your story is your authority. Author and authority are basically the same words. So, so part of the challenge then to the church is, first of all, know where your true identity is. You can look at the lens. You can look through all these other issues of gender, race, and all this other stuff, class. But the primary glasses that you put on to look at all these the primary lens has got to be, as a follower of Jesus, the lens of Christ. Okay, so um, lens of Christ, um, going through the scriptures and the authority of scriptures being evident and and, and real. Um, so you've been sort of writing in this space for as long as I've been reading in this space, right? So, I mean, you have uh, uh, been a voice in the midst of some of these cultural conversations. We were joking before we came on that the word postmodern was something we used and engaged, and then, you know, then that kind of went a different direction. 
as you look back, um, and you still got plenty to look forward, but as you look back to the decades of trying to help people engage culture, any any lessons that you learn or say, anything surprised you, anything like, I didn't think we'd be here, but we are here. I mean, what does Len Sweet, cultural observer for decades, think of the cultural moment we're in? Well, I think it's a, um, it's a one that's really pregnant with, with possibilities for a tremendous good and tremendous evil. And, um, and I, I mean, I, as I look back at what I had failed to, to see uh, in the past, I, I didn't, I failed to appreciate the power of franchise. Um, I, I thought that everybody really wanted to be a unique, original, one of a kind uh, person. And the, the, the human species is really a lemming species. We, we don't want to be one of a kind original. We want to be like everybody else. And I failed to appreciate that. And, and I failed to appreciate um, the, the fact that humans need, they, they need a franchise. They need to go to franchises. They need to, to, uh, to take on the franchise form. I think once they franchise, then, then they, they want to make it their own. But there's an initial pull. And so I think that's one of the big things I got wrong. Um, because I, I began my ministry thinking, no, part of the human uniqueness is that every human wants to be unique. And I realized that that is really not so. The, the other thing I think that I've also learned, and I think you probably learned this too. Jesus said, "You, I have more things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. Okay. Hmm. And so he didn't tell them. I mean, he, he's saying, you got to wait to the future and you're not ready to hear them. And I think in talking about what what the church is going to be facing in the future, I may have violated that principle too many times. I, I've just gone up to the edge and I went over the edge and I said, and then this is what we're going to have to face. And that's when people shut down. Len, it's interesting because um, to see how the world's changed, when I first engaged, interacted with you decades ago, you were sort of seen as pretty out there. You're pretty um, pushing the limits, making people think. Um, and still, I would say, do those things. But I listen to you today, you sound, and as the world has changed, you sound more, I don't know what the right word would be. Uh, I want to say conservative, but I don't know that I put that term on you. But as the world has just sort of raced off on so many issues, and you're talking about going through, not around the biblical narrative, you're talking about you know Christ, uh, Christ centrality and all that sort of stuff. Um, how, how has it gone from 30 years ago or more being a voice in one time to today being a voice today and and how does your ministry and your emphases reflect that am i am i misreading that is there a better way to describe what i described about lynn sweet in 2022 well i i i don't think i've i've gotten more uh, i maybe i've just become more christ focused if you want Good. Um, Good. but my theology, I'm, I, when somebody, you know, I live on both coasts, so somebody was introducing me once, and I think they were trying to say I was bicoastal, but they announced I was bipolar. <laughs> and, um, and when everybody got a, gave that a little uh, you know, chuckle, then they decided to go with it. And he has this bipolar life, and he has this bipolar ministry. <laughs> and by the time I got up to speak, I, I didn't know what to do. Should I rebuke him and say, no, I'm really not bipolar, but there were a couple thousand people there. And I'm sure some of those people there were. So I just decided to go with it. But I, I do think there is a little, everybody to be a follower of Jesus got to be a little bipolar. And by that, I mean this, um, that my theology, the older I get, my theology is becoming more complex, more nuanced, more sophisticated. But at the same time, my faith is getting more simple is simplifying and my theology is complexifying. I just put the two words together and it comes out simplex, the simplexity of my life. And my faith is getting more simple. Jesus said, unless you become as a child, you won't enter the kingdom. So I'm becoming more and more as a child with a childlike, not a childish, but a childlike faith that's all around Jesus. At the same time, my theology is getting more complex. It's getting more nuanced. It's getting more subtle. Um, it's becoming more adult, if you will. You, you know, Len, earlier you said something, and I, I don't want to miss that. You said that um, there is something about how humans are, need franchise that you overlooked uh, uh, in the past. I, I'd like for you to unpack that and especially if, um, apply that to church leaders as they're thinking about the future of the church. How, how might we not miss that moving forward, understanding that humans need franchise? 
we, we, we seem to need a, a template. We seem to need a blueprint. Um, people have trouble coming up with that template themselves and um, for themselves. And I'm a big camp meeting person, Ed. I grew up camp meetings and I still preach at camp meetings every summer. I do at least one camp meeting a year. And when I, I, I'm doing a long-term project called Beulah Land, which is a study of continuous camp meetings, they're still going on. But in my study of how uh, these camp meetings were built, what happened was everybody in these camp meeting cabins, you know, you had the tabernacle, the tent, and then became the, the auditorium or whatever. But the, the, the cottages that they built around it, they were all the same. Everybody wanted a cottage like everybody else's. But once they built it, and made it like everybody else's. In other words, they wanted a franchise um, camp meeting cottage. But once they did it and they had it in, then they made it their own. They couldn't start from scratch and do something unique from the ground up. They had to have the, the, the franchise. They had to have everybody wanted the same cottage that looked the same. But once they got that, then they were able to customize it and and and, uh, and make it artisanal, if you will, and, and homemade, homespun. So there is this need for templates. There is this need for, um, for blueprints and formulas. And um, I initially started out not thinking that that was as important as it is. Yeah, it does seem that, um, you know, we see that in some of the popular, like someone learns and listens to a certain church leader who's doing church a certain way, and then... That does become franchised. I mean, so, but but I, typically when I hear that, I hear that being critiqued. You know, I think about the book uh, McChurch. I think about you know people use. I mean, when when a when there's a book written on the church that uses the word franchise in it, it's almost always negative. Um, so how does that work then? Because it seems to be the inclination of leaders. You know, our, our audiences, pastors and church leaders, they do say, "I want to learn from this person," and I like how you talk about make modifications, but so how how should we should we see that as a positive thing, or are you just kind of giving in to the cultural inevitability of it? How should we as church leaders and pastors see the impulse towards franchise? Yeah, well, I, I think we just got to realize that that's what that's the human nature is to want um, kind of a kickstart to to have a formula that kickstarts us, and I would minimize the importance of that kickstart that that jump start that that a template and a franchise can do. Um, and, uh, and then, I mean, even if, even how many people, how many mosaics do you have churches, names of churches, even, even the names of churches, we, uh, we, we franchise, uh, we take it and we, we want to use it because it means something to us and we have an emotional investment in it. So I, 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 I don't see it as negative as, as much as I used to, but I do think if it stays there, then we have a danger. But once you get the franchise and you make it your own, then you need to make it local. You need to make it zip code. You need to make it artisanal. Uh, you need to bring in the terroir. Um, terroir. So we, <laughs> See, that's Len Sweet there. That's, he, that's why that's why I have him on for extra. Artisanal was like touch, touching the surface. Now it's more than that. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> so in, in your book, I mean, let me quote a line from your book, because I think this is really helpful. Uh, this is the time for the church to find itself, to learn to be itself, and for new panoramas and pathways to address the world's most urgent challenges. I mean, that's a that's a huge statement, a huge challenge that you're offering there. In your mind, especially as you're thinking about this season that the church in America is in, and maybe the next uh, season that we're going to enter into, what do you think this looks like? And are you seeing any positive signs, any examples of this? Well, I think there are movements all over. I mean, um, I'm a part of one in a in a marginal way called Fresh Expressions that started in England. It's here in the U.S. and it's uh, it's an attempt to um, you know to to encourage the, the leaders of the church to get on the edge and to to be fresh again. I mean, and um, some people might look at Fresh Expressions and say, well, that's more stale expressions than fresh. But but it, it depends on the context that you're in and. And I really think that, um, that the Fresh Expressions movement is a good example of how how we can um, embrace the future positively and embrace all sorts of new ways of, of doing ministry. But it's going to be all the more important um, because 
because we have a grainy future, I call it, G-R-A-I-N, a grainy future. And G stands for genetic engineering, R stands for robotics, A stands for artificial intelligence, I stands for information technology, and N stands for nanotechnology. And these are the driving forces uh, of the future. And the church cannot block the the impact that all of these are going to have together, and especially as they overlap with one another. And um, so we we have got to, and that's why I think our birth story is so important. I mean, the more grainy we get in how we live, um, the more we need to position ourselves in Genesis 1 and 2 and, and be able to say, uh, no, that's not our story. That's not the human story. You can you can do that, but that's not the story that we're in. That's a whole other story. That's an alien story. And if you go in that direction, it's not our human story. So we need to we need more of an immersion, if you will, in the scriptures, uh, in the the story of scriptures, in our birth stories, of what it means to be human. And and so I, I'm all for reading the Bible in a whole fresh way not as chapter and verse, but as one story uh, from Genesis to the maps to see it as one story and to read it cinematically. This culture th- turns, um, th- th- this culture doesn't think in words. It thinks in metaphors and narratives, it thinks in images and stories. And so we've got to read the Bible in the vernacular, in the language of this culture, which is um, metaphor and narrative, image and story. So so that's the only thing I think that's going to be able to, to make, enable us to navigate uh, through these, these incredible volcanoes that are erupting all around us. Yeah. Yeah, the volcanoes are described in the book, Rings of Fire, Walking in Faith Through a Volcanic Future, which is uh, going to follow up to Soul Tsunami, which really was um, a tsunami. I wonder as you reflect back to that, it was, a, it was a unique time in history, but every time is a unique time in history. What caused so many people to be drawn to so Everyone I knew was reading it, to Soul Tsunami. Um, and let's start there, and then I want to talk about how you see what Rings of Fire might be. So why did Soul Tsunami catch the imagination? You had a book before, I agree. I read it. But Soul Tsunami was a breakthrough. Why? I don't – it's a good question. I um, I don't know. I totally didn't anticipate it, and I kept writing while I was doing it. I wrote – Basically, at the same time, Aqua Church and, and Soul Salsa, they were all written about the same time. And so I was working really hard on those. But all of a sudden, I realized that um, people started taking Soul Tsunami seriously. And I think that the time was right to realize that we are entering a whole new new, um, new culture. The change has changed itself. The change was now incremental, not exponential. I mean, exponential, not incremental. That there was, there was a nature of the ch- change that had changed. So I think people were open to this and realizing it and it just hit the right moment. Um, I, the, the problem now is I think we're jaded that we're afraid to, to understand what this means. And um, so that, that's the, and that's why I upped the, the metaphor a little bit to, from a tsunami to a volcano. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I don't think either of those like are going to be things you want to be near, um, but <laughs> Uh, but so 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 it seems that it is a more jaded, it's a more negative time. Here we are in the midst of what I've called a cultural convulsion, unlike anything we've seen since the '60s. But again, you wrote you wrote. I mean, you had to be writing in 2018 to publish in 2019. Um, and then and it's fascinating. You predicted some of the these things that would become evident. So what is it like? We all would recognize there are just volcanoes everywhere. Talk us a little about walking in faith through that. So where does that faith roll? Uh, because right now, I mean, the, the the reputation of Christians is is suffering. There's there's a lot of people being pushed back on faith. So why point people forward to that reality? Yeah, well, and that, we walk by faith, not by sight. And yeah. and and to our, in many ways, I think our faith was made for a time like this. That the more challenging the times become, the greater the the call for a faith that is uh, built um, on a strong and firm foundation, which has to be the foundation of the the story of Jesus. I'm excited about this. I mean, I I do think we are up against some huge forces that I did not see 20 years ago. And and we have the, the technology of grain, but we also have the power blocks. And I call them a a mama, M-A-A-M-A, 
M is is for um, Meta. A is for Amazon. A is for um, um, uh, Apple. Uh, M is for Microsoft, and um, and A is is for Alphabet. So you have these four huge companies. I mean, five huge companies. Um, these these mama companies that are basically monopolies, and they are they're global monopolies. And I mean, what, Amazon has what eighty percent of, of retail. I mean, it's just I, you look at Alphabet. Um, Google, uh, what what part, what what percentage of searches go through the Google search? And you look at every one of these, and especially the meta the coming out of the blockchain that is just on the verge of just on the verge of of taking over and bringing us into Web three out of Web two point You look at all of these, and you go, Our, we need more faith than we ever have before. Hmm. You know, I think it's the uh, economist, uh, his name is Paul Saffo out of Stanford. He's also a, a futurist. And he says, if you want to know what's going to happen 10 years ahead, you'd have to look back, you know, 20 years. And right. I, I'd love to ask you, what are some of the hopeful things that you've seen over the last few decades that you think this is a part of helping to build a hopeful future for the next decade or so moving forward? Well, this is going to be a sound a little strange, but for me, um, Every church now has a new front door, and we've been keep dragging the church, kicking and screaming into into an online world. And COVID overnight, overnight, put in a front door for every church into the online world. And so I'm excited about that, especially as we move from Web 2.0 to Web 3, and all that that's going to entail. I think I think that is. Um, that is a that's huge that we incarnate the gospel in the world that we actually have, not the world that we wish we had, but the world that we actually have. And uh, that's part of the world we actually have is a digital world uh, with this uh, metaverse. So I'm, I'm really excited about uh, the potential of that and, and people's openness. Now, um, I mean, I, I had people on that would follow me on the circuit and would just denounce me because my embrace of this digital technology was seen as white privilege. It was seen as classist as, and, and all these other names that were thrown at me. And now, now those are silent. <laughs> nobody's, nobody's accusing anybody of that anymore because everybody's trying to realizing the necessity of going digital and uh, doing digital uh, ministry. So that doesn't replace the face to face, but the more screen, the more face time, if you will, the more face to face we've got to get as well. So it's both and. And, um, and I think um, the, the culture is getting more global. It's getting more tribal. All of these things. This is so Jesus. This is so, I mean, Jesus is always uh, comes in surround sound. If you're not, not hearing two things, you're not hearing Jesus. Um, because he's always saying, you know, he's the Prince of Peace. He came not to bring uh, of an olive branch, but to bring a sword. And so it's a, it's a both and world. And I think the church is, is better prepared for this both and than it ever has been. If it will just not be afraid and, and no fear, be, be not afraid, no fear. We need to hear that over and over again. Fascinating. The book is Rings of Fire, Walking in Faith Through a Volcanic Future. If you liked uh, Soul Tsunami, you'll see obviously the connection that's there. You know, our audience is pastors, church leaders, uh, men and women who are walking through these really tumultuous times who are, uh, rings of fire is a reality to them, right? So um, what what would you encourage them? We've talked about several different things, but kind of our last question, what would you encourage them to consider, think through, or engage in light of rings of fire and in light of the cultural moment we're in? I, I would just in, entreat them and beseech them to claim their moment. Um, and not to miss their moment. I would not have chosen this moment. As you know, and I'm a historian, church historian. My specialty is 19th century evangelicalism. If I could live any time in history, it would not be now. And so if you go into my house, it's 19th century Victorian culture. You know, my, I, you step into a time warp, but you get to pick your furniture. You don't get to pick your moment. And in the sovereignty and providence of God, God has chosen you and me to serve this present age. I'm not prepared for this world that's out there. I, I'm, 
I, I go, why in the world, Lord, did you pick me? I don't even like this stuff that's going on. I don't, I want to go back into my Victorian world where every meal had two desserts, but you chose me for now. So you must know some things about me. You must have some things and dreams for me that I can't even imagine. So I need to embrace the moment that you gave me. And one day I'm going to be held accountable, not for how well I did ministry for the world I wish I had, or I did faithful church, Lord, for the 1970s. No, but I called you for the 21st century with these 22nd century kids. How faithful were you to that moment that I gave you? And how well did you incarnate the gospel in that culture? So I don't miss your moment. Um, don't miss your moment. This is the moment that God has given us. Don't miss your moment. We've been talking with Leonard Sweet. You can learn more about him at leonardsweet.com. And don't forget to check out his book, Rings of Fire, Walking in Faith Through a Volcanic Future. And you can find more interviews with, uh, with the Setzer Church Leaders podcast, as well as other great content from ministry leaders at churchleaders.com. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments to leave us a review that help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. You've been listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast. For more great interviews, as well as articles, videos, and free resources, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.